to you all for coming, and I want to thank Nesson for arranging this really fun meeting, and also for funding my sabbatical, where I've been for the last month, nine months, and, and a lot of the data and analyses that you'll see were done during that sabbatical. Although, I don't, I wonder if they were sending me a message by scheduling me down here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so the conserved trait is, is called uh, tetradynamy, one of those botanical terms that, that people justly make fun of, but uh, what this means is uh, the, the state of having two short stamens, there's a short stamen, and four long stamens, there's, there's the anthers, they're sticking up. And this is a diagnostic and highly conserved trait in the mustard family Brassicaceae. Almost all of the 4,000 species uh, have this condition of two short and four long stamens. Um, and a few genera have secondarily lost it. The ancestral condition, as uh, judged by the sister group, the capers, is six stamens of equal height. Um, so, uh, the family is, is a, not only is it very large, it's also important, brassica and radish crops, uh, Rabidopsis, um, uh, invasive species like garlic mustard, and uh, this is wild radish, uh, which is one of the world's worst weeds, and if you're interested in weed adaptations in wild radish, my student Amanda Charbonneau wants there be tomorrow. But, so, so here we have this conserved trait in this large and important family, and nobody has a freaking clue why, right? So why should this uh, tetradynamy exist? Oh, and how is it <coughs> um, So uh, last year at these meetings, my student Ann Royer uh, talked about experimental manipulation of the condition of tetradynamy itself. Um, today I want to talk about um, the quantitative difference in height between the two uh, anthers. And unfortunately, I refer to this as anther height dimorphism. It's just the difference in, in heights. And I say unfortunately because it's not a true dimorphism, of course. There aren't two different types of morphs on different individuals. There are two different morphs on every single stamen morph, short and long, on every single flower uh, and every single plant. Um, so uh, some years ago, uh, we reanalyzed some data that I had collected some years before that. I had to look at selection uh, on dimorphism, so you'll see that I'm an old guy here. Um, so, so this is a standard laminate on the selection gradient plot. Um, the y-axis is uh, lifetime seed siring success. Lifetime, these are annual plants, so it's not too hard. Uh, seed siring success through uh, genetic paternity analysis, which back then we did with alizymes, and I know some of you don't know what that is, but <laughs> they're genetic markers that, that work with paternity analysis. Uh, anyway, uh, as usual, the x-axis is the phenotypic trait. In this case, it's standardized to a mean of zero um, and a standard deviation of one, so the mean is right there at, at zero. In, in real life, the mean is a little more than two millimeters different in height between the fish and the wall. Um, and so what we see here is evidence both for negative directional selection, um, highly significant, you know, mostly due to these guys down here, but, but one of these tests that Martin Morgan, my co-author on this, did was, was non-parametric. Um, uh, but also uh, strong evidence for a negative gamma, the quadratic term, which gives you this shape of, well, decreasing slope with increasing uh, values of x. So, so, and uh, Martin tested for an intermediate optimum, and, and it's clearly there. There's a 95% confidence interval. So this is the best evidence, the evidence that we really need for stabilizing selection. That both extremes have low, phenotypes have lower fitness than, than in the middle. And as you see, it's quite close to the, the current population mean. <coughs> so that was one year. We did it in two more years. Oh, sorry. Of course, this stabilizing selection then is consistent, at least in this one year, one population of wild radish, the selection maintaining that dimorphism. So the two subsequent years, still evidence for, for stabilizing selection, um, not much of a beta and a, and a negative uh, gamma in this case, but neither of those gammas are statistically significant. So one question is, uh, perhaps this weak stabilizing selection in these two years is due to a lack of variance for, for this adaptive trait. And of course, Dolph Schluter wrote many years about, uh, ago about the fact that we have limited power at the tails of our distribution to estimate selection. Um, and, and if a trait is a putative adaptation, we always expect this because stabilizing more directional selection will reduce variance, especially those ones that have lower fitness, and so we don't expect to see them in the population anymore. Um, and so as I said, Ann Royer used uh, uh, experimental manipulation to deal with this. What we did to look at the, the quantitative trait was artificial selection. Um, and so despite the fact that uh, 
the correlation between the length, the genetic correlation between the short and long stamens is very high, over 0.9. We got a rapid response, so in five generations, um, here are our lines, two replicate lines selected for uh, less dimorphism, and that's the only direction we selected. We were selecting to, to get closer to that ancestral condition of, of six stamens of equal height. And here is the, uh, the randomly made control lines. And so just from this, I think we can say uh, there's no really strong constraint maintaining detrim tetradynamy in this population of wild radish. Mm -hmm. And I should say we also didn't find correlated responses to selection for a, a wide range of, of traits that, that we measured. Um, but more importantly for the rest of this talk, um, what we did is increase the range of the trait symmetrically, not a ton, about 0.3 millimeters on, on either end, but we more than doubled the variance. So this really gives us um, that increased power. So what we did is took 80 plants, 40 from each of the, the uh, selection and, and control lines, um, and, and created these four arrays of 20 plants each. Um, so, so 80, each, each array had 10 control and 10 selection, five from each of the replicates. So, um, and we took them out of the field. Only one array went out on any one day. So there's only 20 plants. They stayed out there for most of the, the, the day, on average six and a half hours. Um, we measured the floral traits, uh, the, the, the stamen likes on, on every uh, plant, one, one flower from each plant every time they went out. Um, and then these folks, mostly undergrads from, from Reed and Michigan State, um, also observed pollinators on every plant on every day they went out. And we marked every flower that was open every day so that every seed that was set we could attribute to a specific day. Okay? So each array went out over, this is over a two month period, went out six or seven times for a total of, of 25 field days. And so first what we can do is just look overall at, at selection over all 80 plants over all, all 25 field days. And we again, we've doubled the variance in the trait so we should have good power um, just show that, that stabilizing selection that, that we saw in the, the three early years. So here's that result. And no, the slide isn't flipped over. <laughs> so, um, so what we found was, was really good evidence for, for disruptive selection. So, so really no beta, really no linear trend in the data, but a highly significant positive gamma uh, showing uh, disruptive selection. So we wanted to try to understand why this was happening. And so what we looked at first was the, the leading adaptive hypothesis. There are several for, for why there should be four long and two short stamens uh, in Brassicaceae. And, and the one that we have the most evidence for, well, the only one we really have evidence for from our functional studies of pollen production and removal is this one. And it, this comes from, from some theoretical work in the late 80s and early 90s by uh, Harder and Thompson and, and Mo Stanton, which says that under conditions of high visitation and high pollen removal. And, and my former uh, student, Scott Rush, uh, did a study where he found that on average, 85% of the pollen from all six anthers is removed in the first hour that the flowers are, are, are uh, exposed to pollinators. So we have those conditions commonly uh, in wild radish. Under those conditions, the, the plant uh, it may be adaptive to withhold some of the pollen, not put it uh, all at a maximum rate on each pollinator so that you don't get depleted and not have any pollen left for, for subsequent visitors. Um, so uh, the way we tested this then, um, but took a page from uh, Wade and Kayla's 1990, and this is at least the second time today that this paper has been cited uh, at these meetings, uh, and, and that is to measure selection uh, at, across a variable range of your putative selective agent. And they talk mostly about experimental manipulation, but what we're going to do is use the natural variation in pollinator visitation across those 25 days. Remember, we measured visitation each day, and, and we could do selection, measure selection each day because we knew which seeds were produced and, and sired each, each day. And so from that, uh, the prediction is that we expect stabilizing or positive directional selection at high visitation, because that's where dimorphism with withholding your pollen um, should be adaptive. And, and we know this happens. You can even see this here. So there's the long stamen. My butterfly. There's the long stamen anther contacting the body of this cabbage butterfly. There's a short stamen anther down there not contacting the pollen, uh, the, the pollinator's body at all. So, but at conditions of low visitation we might expect selection against dimorphism, because if pollinators are rare, you don't want to withhold pollen. You want to get as much as you can on those few pollinators that, that are going to visit you. 
Um, so so here, here's that analysis, and it's a little complicated. So there's 25 plots, one for each of those days. And again, they're the same. The y-axis is seed siring success through paternity analysis, um, and the x-axis is dimorphism. And then this mega x-axis down here um, is the, the natural variation of visitation rate. And I roughly arrange the plots vertically by um, by the value of gamma, so negative down here, stabilizing selection, and positive up mm -hmm. here. And so what you may have already gleaned <coughs> as I've gone through this is the pattern is exactly opposite, mm -hmm. again, to the prediction that I gave you. <laughs> so we have good evidence at the lowest rates of visitation. So this is the, the mean number of visits that a flower received in the whole time that it was exposed to pollinators. So down here, when they're only getting a few pollinators, we've got good evidence for stabilizing selection. Uh, you know, uh, four of the five of these are significant, even though there's only 20 plants and not all that many offspring genotypes. Um, whereas you start to get uh, significant disruptive selection at, at intermediate levels, and then at high levels of visitation, pretty much all you see is, is disruptive or sometimes no selection. So we can test this a little more rigorously by saying, uh, taking each of these gammas at each of these points and doing a weighted regression, weighted by the standard uh, error of each of these uh, regressions, of, so of gamma now on the same x-axis that visits flower, um, sorry. Uh, and here's what we see. And so this really does support this, this uh, there's a, a good strong linear relationship, about 30% of the variance in gamma is explained by the visitation rate. So, so negative uh, stabilizing selection at the lowest visitation, and, and you only get disruptive selection, positive values of gamma uh, at high rates of visitation. So we don't under, understand how to explain this. And, and the other hypotheses for the adaptive value of Borlong and too short stamens don't involve uh, vis pollinator visitation rates at all, as far as I know. So, so I appreciate your ideas on this. But just to summarize the overall pattern, again, the two years that we have strong evidence for selection, exactly opposite, uh, of course. But what this means, if we go back to the beginning of the, the title of the talk in the conserved trait, now both of these will maintain the current mean uh, uh, because uh, consistent with selection maintaining this, this observed trait. Uh, so, uh, and remember, we, we don't have good evidence uh, for um, constraints on this quantitative trait either. So with that, uh, here's some acknowledgments on behalf of the technician. Yeah. Linda. Have you thought about dissecting it even further down to which pollinators? Because maybe on low visitation days, it was a different sweep than on high visitation days? It, it, it's a really good idea. The, the, the interesting thing in this year, for some reason, 82% uh, of all the visitors were the small bees, mostly helictides, sweat bees, um, that are the most important pollinators. Um, but I tried. Yes, yes, because it, it could be that, that uh, out of 25 days, those low ones have, have a different composition. And as you might know, my former student, Heather Solly, mm -hmm. did look at selection by uh, Six, four, five different taxa of pollinators uh, on, the same, on the same trait dimorphism, and so we might be able to relate it once I do that analysis. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we have a couple more minutes. Well, I've heard some ideas about how the short anthers might be food reward for pollen collecting bees, or, or and, and the tall anthers are more functional and. Right, the feeding okay. anther hypothesis, exactly. and, and other hypotheses have to do with body position of the pollinators. Yeah. Um, but, but again, as far as I know, I don't I think any of those predict differences with different visitation rates. Right. And, and what I, what I, one of the functional things that I didn't say is that the, the short uh, anthers actually produce more pollen on a per anther basis, right. which could be consistent with that. Mm -hmm. um, we have to look, they are fertile, but we haven't looked at that quantitatively. Um, but fewer pollen grains are removed on single visits, even by the pollen cool. eaters. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it could still be that they're feeding and they don't eat that much, and they're getting a ton of pollen uh -huh. from the, the long... Yeah, I mean, one of the detailed close-up video studies of pollinator behavior, I think, might be necessary. <laughs> okay.